I'm going to talk about the Battle of Khitin, among other things, so uh, the heat might have been a little... Um, yeah. Well, um, you've probably noticed, but uh, in the Levant, in this area, there is no shortage in uh, different kinds of conflicts, conflicts of different characteristics and different, uh, different scales, and specifically, at the, at the times of, uh, of the rule of the Latin East, um, there is no shortage of, uh, of conflicts, uh, again, of different characters, but uh, I can still characterize them to two main categories, among, among others. The first one would be events which are related to the landscape, things which are occurred in the landscape, such as ambushes, battlefields, fighting march, you know, fighting while moving. And on the other hand, uh, the other category would be ones which are connected in some way or the other to urban context. Okay, the siege of a city, um, uh, raids on cities, on castles, or vi vi villages. Now, today I'm going to uh, to give you. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about methodology, about landscape archaeology, and how it helps with understanding of those uh, um, events, finding those events in the landscape. I'm going to speak about several case studies, and of course, as you can see here, uh, two of them are related to the first category of landscape related. And the, two, and the two others are related to case studies which are uh, related uh, uh, to siege. Um, of course, uh, each one of those characters deserves its own, uh, 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 its own lecture, but uh, today I would, just, I would like to show you some samples, some examples uh, through uh, things that I've been dealing with, uh, with colleagues from here, mainly with Adrian, um, and uh, and to to see what uh, what was recently a few developments which are related to those uh, to those events and what do we learn about them because of the combination between landscape reconstruction and of course the sources about them. Okay, so each one of those types of violent events has its own uh, archaeological characteristics, its own signature, and of course uh, it depends on the types of weapons architecture of war, like fortification, encampments, earthworks, all sorts of things which are related to some kind of the conflicts, while also uh, each one of those conflicts will have its own uh, characteristic according to what we find in the field, and especially, you know, artifacts distribution and things like, uh, and patterns and things like this. So we need to think about, it's not just, uh, we have to think very closely about each one of the case studies that we're taking to understand what should be expected or actually what would be the pattern that we should uh, we should be uh, looking for, and therefore uh, change our, uh, our work throughout uh, this way? Um, for instance, just for as, a, for as one example, hand-to-hand -hand combat would be different, had a very different kind of material signature, okay, from uh, the one of ballistic firing, okay, when people are shooting arrows at each other. Uh, usually, those arrows are left behind, and um, things which are rela related to horsemanship while people are usually stripped off from their clothing. When people are doing hand-to-hand -hand combat, it's a little bit more, uh, uh, the contacts makes more things break off and tear off. So it's more likely that in a hand-to-hand -hand contact, you would find elements such as buckles, personal items, things which are related to uh, broken parts of, uh, of weapons and things like this, while in ballistic fighting you would find other things, other kind of, a different kind of material signature. So the first case study that I was dealing with, well, because I was the first one to do so in this, uh, in this region, uh, I obviously picked the Battle of Chitin. I don't know if any of you had the choice, would have picked uh, maybe something else, but that was my choice. There was no battlefield archaeology or the study of conflicts uh, was, uh, wasn't done before that. We've did, we did quite a lot of, uh, uh, of study of conflicts in this country, but all of them were related in some way or the other to, um, uh, to urban context. And I mean siege operations from different periods. Metzada is a good example, Lachish is a good example for those. And uh, things which are related to urban context like uh, hideout complexes from the different revolts and things like this. But the open fields, the open field battlefields were never, uh, were never dealt with. And um, the Battle of Chitin, a little bit of, uh, of data. Uh, most important here is to see the scale. The battle itself, we're talking about an area of over 27 kilometers, okay? And this brings us to the main, you know, we're talking about 
The name is the Battle of Chitin, but the horns of Chitin, this volcano, this is actually just one of one fraction of the story. The story is between the horns of Chitin and the 27 uh, kilometers to the west of it. So, the written sources were, were studied, and there are quite a lot of them from different uh, uh, sources, different, uh, different uh, sites, and they were also studied extensively, but there was no archaeological work that was done on it. And I was acting, act, uh, asking myself, in search for the relative truth, of course, only relative truth and not the real truth, how does one study an event in the landscape? And we have problems doing that. It's not, it's not uh, you jo don't just come with a metal detector and pick up the arrowheads and, and you got the event, okay? There are many questions that need to, be, to, need to be answered before you go and do that. And some of them are laid before you here. A few thoughts. First of all, is a battlefield an archaeological site? By Israeli law, it's not. Okay, just so you know. So battlefields are not protected. Uh, what are the boundaries of such a site? You've seen Battle of Chitin, 27 kilometers, basically, or maybe even more. Maybe we should. The battle the battlefield started when the Muslims came back down from the Golan Heights. Who knows? Uh, how do you how do you uh, put the boundaries to something like this? How does one study archaeologically a sightless or dispersed site? And most importantly, is how do one catch a fraction of time in human duration in the open landscape? Where usually, when you, we do study archaeologically, we do study a, a specific day or a specific event. Usually, it would be inside. Uh, what we call a destruction layer, and of course, here there is no destruction lay layer to be found. To be found, when archaeologists are usually dealing with periods, and here we are trying to find a specific day in the history of man. How do one do that? How can we see say that we did find the, exactly uh, the material signature, signature of the 4th of July, 1187, for instance, or the 7th of September? 1191, if we're speaking about the Battle of Al Suf, so um, you need to do a little bit of changing of uh, of your of your mindset and uh, try to think out of the box, as we say, because conventional result, well, conventional thinking will probably end up with conventional results, and here trying to to a little bit uh, do something more, uh, um, think about things in the other way. This is the landscape of Chitin. If I would treat it as a normal archaeologist. I would go to the different sites, including the, the homes of Chitin over here and other sites around and explore them. I first of all had to move the focus from the sites themselves to the landscape. And the landscape is becoming the archaeological site with all the different features in the landscape, including modern one. Why do you have to study also modern features such as road systems, field systems, things like this, even the layout of, I don't know, like a ranch, uh, uh, fences and things like this, those things might be related to continuity, to continu continuity and things which we, we are seeing today in some way are echoing to things that have been, uh, have been done or have been uh, laid in the past. So looking at this entire landscape <laughs> as the archaeological site. Looking at the case study from a wide, right perspective, also when we're talking about siege operations and things like this, trying to look at, at things from... Uh, uh, it's very hard when you go and research a battlefield which is called the Battle, the battle of Hatim, and you have this amazing volcano in front of your face the whole day, and in a way I had to, put, to turn my back to it, realizing that, yes, I'm drawn to this volcano and to what happened there, but this is not the story. I have to understand the volcano, or for instance, or as an example here, the city of a the walls of Ash Ashkelon, just as one of the features which are bringing together the landscape. This is just one part of a much greater story, which is the landscape of Ashkelon, or the landscape of Chitin, or the landscape of Al-Suf. Um, Multi-site and multi-periods. When you're walking in the landscape, all of the all of the periods are represented, and you can't, you know, it's not like Okay, so in the 12th century, nobody ever has ever stepped here. You don't have this case. And the same people are just, they're living in the landscape just as much they're living in settlements. So you have to understand that you are moving, you need to move, you need to do things in a proper, proper archaeological way, but you, in your mindset, you have to also to understand that you can go between periods. You know, you, you, you need to 
to move from one side to the other, from the site to the landscape, and so so the same with also with uh, with periods. Um, And we have quite a lot of challenges in the study of, uh, of landscape itself, and I don't want to go too much into it, but uh, uh, as I've already mentioned, some of, uh, some of the things uh, over here, uh, one thing that we don't have in the landscape, or we do have, but it's not as obvious as in the archaeological tell, or site, or the conventional archaeological site, is stratification. Okay, you see we have Israelis and this is probably there. So, um, um, stratified, stratified things in the landscape. How do you how do you know that that a, a specific feature, okay? How do you know how to identify to a specific period? This can sometimes be much more problematic than uh, than in other cases. So uh, until this point, I presented you with mostly with problems, okay? Now how do you solve them, okay? So. Um, I'm taking a, a very famous historian, I think you, all of you are noticing, in order to, uh, 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 to build a model which is basically a landscape reconstruction which is, which is based on the different uh, intervals of things in the landscape, starting from reconstructing the landscape from the structural level through the cultural level, and then only after you've basically you know how the landscape looked like in different periods, or how it developed through different periods, and specifically at the time of the event that you're researching, now you can go back and say, well, this road existed, or this terrace didn't exist, and this will give us some idea about how the landscape looked at the eve of the event, and try now to go back to the sources put into it also the archaeological, archaeological artifacts which might be related to the event and then all together, all together um, uh, get a picture which is, or get, get an idea which is a little bit closer um, to the relative uh, truth. So in order to do that, you have to walk between disciplines as well. For archaeology, being an archaeologist, archaeology is the main thing, but also of course historical sources, but also environmental sources. And each one of them is laid on, on the other, where the structural sources that you have, the, topo the topography, uh, even sunlight and moonlight, as we will see in a moment, the movement of soil, and the historical uh, data, and finally the archaeological or the material signature of the battle itself, all of them together might provide us with some idea about what really happened. Just as an example, sun, sunlight and moonlight, we hardly uh, take them into consideration when we study of archaeological uh, event. Now if we look specifically at the Battle of Chitin, there's a very um, nice program in that in Tel Aviv uh, University's uh, 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 stars observation uh, point where you can go back in time or to the future 5,000 years, just put the date and you get all the solar information about a specific day in the history of, uh, of man. And you go and you can see that the night between the 2nd and the 3rd of July, and you suddenly learn when was the moonrise and when was the sunset. Sunset at, at 6.50, moonrise only 15, 14 minutes after midnight. And you suddenly realize whether this was a dark night, how dark was it when the, su when the moon was actually rising. It was only in 22 percentage, okay? Is it a good night for riding? Not so much, okay? What about hiding from arrows, on the other hand? Someone is shooting at you and they were fighting. Between the 3rd and the 4th of July, they were still constantly fighting throughout the night in, by uh, 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 Birgit Maskana. So you could be hide, maybe it could be easier to hide from, uh, from arrows, but riding throughout that night would not be that good. Wind direction and velocity, okay? Also important for all sorts of reasons. Uh, ballistic firing, you know? And uh, for instance, the range of, uh, the ranges, the range of, uh, of arrows and things like this. I wanna move onward to the, to the different, uh, different things. Um, I'm going to show just a few things from the Battle of Chitin, or things that we've learned from the Battle of Chitin. One of the interesting things that I've, I've tried to understand is the movement of people through the archaeological landscape, through the different features. Not just the topography, but 
If you have terraces and you have roads, if those terraces, which are to the height of a meter and a half in average, a horse cannot jump over them, or at least not 500 horses at the same time, if they existed at the time of the battlefield, on the battlefield, they could be some sort of a, of a problem. Just like if we all of us would now try to, uh, to, to go out from, this, uh, from one door at the same time, the landscape also makes people move in a, in a, certain, in a certain way. So we, if we take the road leading from Sephori to, to the Horns to Hittin or towards Tiberias, it's actually it's a Roman road. You can still see it and you will see it in, a, in an aerial photograph in a moment. It's quite one of the widest Roman roads that we have in this country. 10 meters in, in width, and actually it was, it's actually even wider throughout some of the periods. If we look at an aerial photograph from 1945, you can see the road, it's the same road, but you can also see that there is a very extensive field system which goes to the road. Now, if I study this field, field system, and I can tell you for sure that it dates from the second century CE, hence, late Roman, okay? So what we see here in 1945 is maybe at least what we see here in 1945 was present as a field system at the time of the event. What does it mean for the people walking off that road? It means that they were actually confined to the road itself and would not be able to walk on the sides. Now if you take a big army and you have to stretch it along this road, okay? It ex and each one of us has his body mass, and with the horses and everything, we actually you can get some idea. This is not a very good uh, scale because those would be very big giants. But um, if all of them were confined to this road, it tells you you can actually almost measure the minimum area that they would have to spread, and it would also explain you how long would the crusader march have to be, or have to stretch on, and how easy it was for the Muslims to cut them off, okay? You have a similar system just under the horns of Hittin, and you can see those terraces over here. They average a meter, a meter and a half in, uh, in height. And this is another aerial photograph. This is the horns of Hittin. This is the area to the south of the horns of Hittin. This is in 1945 again. And what I've marked in, in, in yellow is another Roman road this time 4.25 meters wide okay 4.25 meters wide now you can see the same kind of field system it's also the coaxial field system from the roman period this is overlaid like this now if we're trying to move the crusader forces through that on that road it tells you exactly you know that you know they couldn't walk in one formation but they would have to go in indian uh, sort of uh, file thing. Um, so this is one thing, you know, confining people to, to areas. The walls of Hittin themselves, you can see a plan of uh, excavations which were conducted at the horns of Hittin. Um, and uh, you can see the walls, the walls date to the 10th century BC. And we can see from this photograph taken by John Garstang in 1932 that the walls were actually continuous. Today there is an opening here. Well, if you come from the fields on the west, you can actually climb to the horns of them, uh, themselves, but they used to be closed. This is a very important piece of information to know where the horses could actually come from the fields of Hittin and climb up into the crater between, between the, the one to the main crater of the volcano. And apparently they couldn't. Only in 1949, when this road was open, people could actually come into the horns themselves. And this is quite important, telling us, basically, that if you wanted to stay on your horse on that day, you wouldn't be able to climb up to the horns of Hittin. So the refuge, the hill itself, could have been refuge only for foot soldiers or those who decided to, to walk up. We can, the landscape uh, reconstruction, we can basically can bring us back to this, uh, to this uh, uh, final sort of, uh, uh, of moments of the battlefield. We can know the position of uh, Salah Hadin because of his sons uh, 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 standing next to him, basically passing on um, he, his notes about the final stages of the battle. You have the horns of Hittin, this is the mountain. As we said, horses cannot climb up to the mountain uh, itself. The coaxial field system, those terraces I was talking about at the south, maybe a few people could pass through them, but definitely not an entire army or whatever is left from it. Here on the northern part of the Khatin plain, 
the very steep slopes, almost, you know, like very real drops. Horses cannot come down into them. So once the crusaders are going up to this area, they're basically caught between different archaeological and topographical features, just like this. The fire could be lit at a very specific point. Because of most of the time, the wind in the summer is coming from the west. If at any moment before the crusaders are passing Salah Adin and his men to the east, he would actually create, you know, either uh, burn himself and his men or create a, a smoke screen between him and the, and the crusaders. So uh, to a very specific moment, he could, he could only uh, put fire to the fields and then when they are caught between the mountain, the field system with the terraces and the slopes, this is basically bringing it all uh, together. So um, this is just one example. We'll see another one a little bit later. I'll run, I'll, I'll go, I have 10 minutes, right? So, so I'll, go, I'll go a little bit, uh, I'll go a little bit uh, uh, faster on those things. Just, uh, just to show you a few examples, I've taken what I've did in my uh, doctorate and in, in a few postdoctoral works, I've tried to look at siege operation, whether if we take the site and turn our back to it and look at the landscape, Let's see what we can learn about siege operation. I'll show you uh, two quick examples. One of them is here. The Battle of Ashkelon, or, or the Siege of Ashkelon now depends which one, the one of 1153 or 1187. Very famous story about um, uh, the siege tower, which was brought to the Jerusalem gate, to the eastern uh, uh, tower of uh, the gate. And what I've noticed is that you can actually see this in the landscape. And not only that you can see the remains of this rampart of the siege tower in the landscape, you can actually, it's actually uh, implicated the development of the city of Ashkelon from the moment that it, it was laid uh, onwards. Look at those two, two aerial uh, photographs. We have sand coming from the sea through a valley which is 400 meters from, from the side. It's coming in and it's all stopping at the gate. You see the movement of sand? Here are a few more examples now you have, this is a photograph from uh, about 20 years ago. This is 1980s, looking into the tail from the sea. And this is from 1945, and you can see the sands. You can see the sands coming from the south. But it was a phenomena already known in the 19th century. You can see this also in Condor and Kitchener's map from uh, 1881. And you can still see today, sand coming in stopping at this line. So I have the possibility, and here you can see everything is green, and from here southwards everything is actually sandy. So what I think is we can actually reconstruct not just the position of the siege tower or the siege rampart or what is left from it, whether it's from 1153 or from Saladin's uh, 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 conquest of the city, we have the rampart itself, which would be, would give us the position of the of the of the where the walls were breached, maybe even a counter rampart that was used for artillery, and we can build we can basically reconstruct the entire siege based on the, the landscape reconstruction. And uh, I've done something similar in Montfort. I won't go into the details too much, but it's a project which is uh, directed by Adrian Boas, Professor Adrian Boas. Um, many questions about this place. The road system, the road system around Montfort tells us quite a lot about the different features. For instance, if you see the, the regional roads are actually the ones which are leading to the, to the building in the, in the valley, while only the local roads are the ones which are leading to the council itself. It tells you something about the possibility that maybe the structure in the valley is actually earlier than the council, because the road system is directed to the structure in the valley and not to the to the um, and not to the castle itself. If we speak specifically about the siege, and there are two of them of uh, of Montfort, the city, the the castle, the castle spur, and you have uh, another spur to its south. Um, I was doing something very simple, basically looking at uh, sight lines, okay, sight lines and different killing zones, and with the range of uh, of, uh, of artillery. I've tried to make a reconstruction of uh, those things where they could come from. You see that little brand. 
sitting on one of the uh, Fibosche walls we found. Landscape reconstruction, which, which, which again brought uh, many new light about uh, quarry, maybe even a cemetery um, in the area and other things, but allowed us also to present a reconstruction of the different watch points and also potential places for Mamluk artillery, judging with the range. So one position, I think I found one position, 200 uh, meters to the east of the castle spare, on the castle spare itself, and another one on the spare which is uh, dominating the castle from the south. This is the two different positions. And 200 meters from the donjon, we found, I found this platform of uh, 30 by 27 meters of, uh, of stones, which probably was used as something to stabilize this kind of mechanism. On the castle spur, we found something similar, okay, a terrace overlooking the donjon from the south, and next to it, one of Baibar's uh, coins, which you all recognize. I'll move to, uh, now to just one final thing to show you um, that regarding the Battle of Arsuf, if I may. Two minutes. Um, so in the Battle of Arsuf, um, going back to open battlefields, actually showed us that it works in both directions. One of the big questions about the Battle of Arsuf, uh, before I started dealing with this, with, with it, was basically uh, what was the, where was the battle itself, or the final stages of the battle, and also, um, we know um, that the battle, uh, during the battle, uh, Richard, Charles de Leon, he, he was charging three times against uh, the Muslims, against uh, the Muslims, and three of his charges were stopped at the, uh, at the edge of the forest, of an oak, oak forest. But the oak forest was gone. The oak forest is gone from the, um, um, it's completely gone from, uh, from the um, in before before uh, the Great War, and so the question was, where was the battlefield, and where was the where was the oak forest, which is a relic forest, which is gone, and this is how it worked. Once we uh, did the landscape reconstruction and we found the location of uh, what the remain, what looks like the remains from the battlefield, we can actually assess where would be the Muslims' positions according to the arrowheads that were shot towards the crusading, to the marching uh, crusading, crusaders. And once we have assessed that, I went back to the map, and this is the Kutin map from 1799, and I've looked at it, and I've outlined the line, the edge of the forest, which was still visible on the map, and looked at, uh, at this aerial photograph, for example, published by Keidal uh, many years ago, and you can see that there is a similarity here in what you see in the echoes or the shadows in the aerial photograph, to the line, to the old line of the forest. And if we put the two things together, one on, on the other, this is sort of the, the battle plan on Keidao's uh, photograph. Now, so one for all and all for one, basically I'm saying that in order to understand a historical event, whether it's in the landscape or whether it's in the site orientated, we have to take the environment, the archaeology, and the history to put them all together actually in the same level, in an equal level. Some historians might not like that, but to put them in equal level in order to get as close as possible uh, to the relative uh, truth. And it really works in, in both directions, especially in the case of the, the Battle of Al Suf, where we actually found the relic forest because we found the battlefield. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.